Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar today. It's just about 2.01 p.m., so we're just going to go ahead and get started. Um, looks like everyone is getting into the room and getting uh, already starting to figure out the chat piece. So um, just want to say thanks, to everyone, for being here today. Uh, we're back after a break for the summer, and we're excited to dis discuss a topic that's at the top of everyone's minds these days, which is what the heck is going on with the economy. Uh, my name is Kevin Miller. I'm the marketing director here at Chimura, and will be your host today. This is my first webinar since I've joined the company, so you can blame any of the technical issues on me and not uh, the CEO of the company. Um, talking, of, uh, talking about Chris, um, so talking about the speakers today, um, Chris Chimura will be our speaker. Um, she is the founder, CEO, and chief economist of Chimura. And just while, we, while we're talking there, we'll get a few housekeeping items out of the way um, today. So... Just to let you all know, we will send out an email pretty soon within the next couple of days um, with a link to the recording of the webinar and a link to download the slides that we go through today. Um, we also want to encourage your questions uh, with this topic. We're kind of, you know, the top of everyone's minds again today. We're sure that there'll be a lot of questions. So put your questions in the chat um, and we'll get to as many as we can towards the end. Um, and with all that said, let's go ahead and, and get started. Um, so for those of you who are new to our webinars, uh, we like to start with a quick uh, overview about who Chimura is. Um, you know, as a company, we provide labor market data and analysis through our software and consulting, which enables our clients to make informed decisions to help their communities and companies thrive. Uh, we were founded in 1998 by Chris, who's going to be our speaker today. We have offices here in Richmond, Virginia, where we're talking to you from today, and Cleveland, Ohio, but we serve uh, hundreds of clients all over the country. Uh, our employees are economists, data scientists, statisticians, and business professionals who truly care about helping our clients grow their communities and organizations. And this, this leads to what really drives us as a company, which is our client satisfaction and really ensuring their success. Um, really, you'll see this in action within our Jobs EQ software, where the average response time to a client chat inquiry is less than a minute, and the response comes directly from our economists and data governance team. It's, it's really remarkable and something that we're truly proud of. Um, and kind of, you know, talking along those lines, you know, what excellence is always what we strive for in customer service and really within within the quality of our data. In addition to excellence, the three other ideals that guide us as, as a company are being thorough, striving for accuracy, and making sure that our data services and resources are as useful as they can be to our clients. And really just kind of want us to go over one of those resources that we provide um, to our clients and, and people. Uh, really, we just want to make sure that that folks have access to to updated and accurate labor labor market data. Um, so, one of the resources we provide is our weekly economic update, which is usually sent over the weekend and gives an overview of national data and provides analysis of the prior week in the economy. Uh, if you're interested in receiving this, uh, the link you see at the bottom of the screen, which will always which will also be in the slides that you receive, um, can be accessed and you can sign up directly through there. There's also a sign up on the homepage. Um, at Tremura.com. So now all that said, I'll turn it over to Chris to talk about our upcoming users conference, uh, which we're all really excited about hosting again. Hey, Chris, I think you might be muted. Could you go ahead and, and turn your, your mic back on? Okay, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear, thanks. I'm assuming you can hear me now. Yes. Um, so thanks, Kevin. Um, so our Jobs EQ User Summit is in Cleveland, Ohio, October 10th through 13th. It's entitled All You Need is Data. If you go to our um, website, you can see why we've used that as our um, title. It will be at the Ritz-Carlton. You can go and enjoy some workshops, uh, network with friends, Chimura folks, data experts, and um, we'll also have some fun things that we'll be doing. We have a great lineup of speakers. 
at the conference. Uh, here are some highlights. Derek Hilbert with Haynes Brands, Mark Schweitzer with the Cleveland Fed, uh, Susan Davenport from the Greater Houston Partnership, and, and many more. So um, do sign up. The block um, ends this week for the hotel. And by the way, we got a great rate. It's just a little bit above 200. If you were to go to the Ritz in Cleveland right now, the rate would be over $500 a night. So we'd love to have you join us. Uh, with that, let's get to what's going on with the economy. And it's all about inflation, underscored. That's what the bottom line is that we'll get to today. And if, and if it wasn't clear that it's all about inflation, it became very clear when the inflation number came out this morning, a little hotter than expected, 8.3% from a year ago, and the market sold off. At one point, it was down 700. I haven't looked at it recently, but hopefully by the time we get to the end of this presentation, you'll understand why the market is reacting like it is to those inflation numbers. Before we get to that, though, um, are we in a recession? Um, there are some questions about that, and we'll hit on that first. And then secondly, why do we even care about inflation? And third, if we care so much about inflation, how did the Fed miss it? And then when will we get back to normal in terms of uh, inflation and the economy? So beginning then with um, um GDP, it's the broadest indicator of economic activity. It comes out on a quarterly basis. And here, the last two recessions were very unusual. The COVID recession, when we had a lockdown, so it was sharp and deep, but it was very um, short. Here, we go back to the Great Recession that was long. It was the deepest recession that we had had since the Great Recession. Since I'm sorry, since the Depression. So we call this one the Great Recession. But um, now we look at the last two months, two quarters, I'm sorry, first and second quarter, down 1.6%, down 0.9%. Those are annualized numbers. And everywhere across the globe, two consecutive declines in GDP signify a recession. So why are we not calling this a recession here in the U.S.? Or that is, why are some people not calling it a recession? And that's because there's a group called the National Bureau of Economic Research, and they're the arbiter of recessions in the U.S. So no, two straight declines in GDP do not qualify as a recession here in the U.S. This business cycle dating committee within the NBER looks at five indicators to determine whether we're in a recession. And these are monthly indicators rather than quarterly. So four of them are shown here. Employment. And you can see employment is growing. This is data through August. So that does not in indicate a recession. Industrial production is up. It's slowing down a bit, but it's up 4% from a year ago. Uh, this is output that's from manufacturing, utilities, and construction. Um, sorry, manufacturing, utilities, and mining companies. And then Two other indicators they look at is consumer spending or consumption, as it's called. Um, consumers make up about 70% of GDP, so they're very important to the economy. And here you can see the impact of the shutdown in the economy. Then we saw stimulus money and people getting back out and spending. And now we're looking at spending from a year ago, still around 4%. That's services and goods. And then income is um, the fourth indicator they look at. And here you can see, again, it dropped off a bit um, early into the pandemic. It increased as we got the three different stimuluses. Um, and we're looking at it from a year ago. It fell because we had a stimulus in the previous year. But now we're up about 5%. So nothing here shows that we're in a recession. And if you want to read more of the details, we have a blog called The Five Horsemen of a Recession. You can click on this later indicator that we haven't talked about yet is retail sales. So retail sales make up about 40% of consumer spending. Again, consumer spending is very important to the economy. And you could see that it drops off during recessions, during the COVID reception. It has slowed a bit, but we're not seeing a sharp drop like we did in the previous two recessions. So um, one of the things that causes us to think that consumer spending will slow in the coming um, is because the stimulus is, uh, we're not seeing the stimulus money coming in as largely, and we're seeing uh, consumer savings back to pre-COVID levels. By the way, all of these gray shaded areas are recessions. So typically, 
consumers, the amount of money they have saved is around a trillion dollars. That's what we saw prior to um, the COVID recession. Here, because of the stimulus, it went up to nearly 5 million. Even um, after receiving the stimulus, it was still above 2 mil, uh, trillion, back up to 3 trillion, and now we're back down to 1 trillion. And in fact, we've seen consumer um, debt starting to increase. So consumers don't have the money in savings anymore. We expect that that's going to have uh, a slowing impact on the economy. Another sign that we're seeing of slowing is in job ads. If you're a client of ours, then you may be using JobsEQ, which is our software that uh, considers labor data. It also has job postings in it. So we scrub. Um, we have over a million job postings in the site, scrubbing over 40,000 sites a day. And here in blue, you can see this is for the U.S., uh, the number of job ads. Um, this is through August 22nd. And notice here that if we go back to about June 27th, we saw a peak. And right now we're seeing job posts down 6.5% since June. And you can see if we go back further um, here, you can see that they've come down even uh, more so. This gray line shows you where they were last year. So you might think this is a cyclical issue, uh, not according to what we saw last year. Last year this time we were seeing job posts increase. Um, and here you can see where most of the jobs are, nurses, computer related, software developers. Another sign of slowing is when we just look at the job ads for staffing firms, they're down 8.3% since the um, peak in job ads. And the reason why we look at that is because typically when the economy is slowing, employers don't bring on workers as much. And in fact, they prefer to bring on workers from a staffing company because if they have to let them go, they could just call up the staffing company and say, you know, the, um, the period of time during which we want to employ them has ended. Um, and so typically uh, job ads for staffing firms are even a le leading indicator of overall job ads. So we are seeing some slowing occurring in the economy based on the numbers that we've looked at here, but clearly um, we're not in recession um, yet in terms of what the NBER looks at. So, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about what we expect to see a year from now in terms of the economy. But before going there, why do we even care about inflation? Um, why is it so important to this economy? So first, let's take a look at the measures of inflation. So CPI, that's the one that came out this morning. I didn't update this um, since that number for August came out, but like I said, it was up 8.3% from a year ago. So year over year, it was right about here. And consumer price index is based on a basket of goods um, that are um, tracked every month. And that basket of goods changes maybe every couple of years, but the Fed prefers to look at the personal consumption expenditure price index because this changes every month. So if you, for example, were spending less money on gas and more money on food, um, there would be an adjustment made in how, how much of each contributes to the actual inflation rate. So PCE, not as bad as the CPI, but there's no doubt about it. We're at 40 year highs um, and inflation is starting to have an impact on the economy. Now we can break down inflation into very specific items. Like I said, you can look at clothing, uh, you can look at button down shirts, long sleeve, short sleeve, all those things are tracked and then they're summed up. So again, here's the total. But one of the interesting things that we've seen during this um, um, expansion period after COVID was that when we went into the COVID um, lockdown, people spent more money on goods. So you couldn't go to the gym, so you, you bought a pot. Peloton. Um, you, um, there were more money spent on uh, renovating houses, maybe buying computers because you were working from home. And as a result, because of all the demand, commodities and good prices went way up. You can see up 14% from a year ago, whereas services, you couldn't go out and get your hair cut. Salons were cut, um, closed for a while. Uh, we didn't go to hotels or restaurants. Some of those were closed for a while. So those prices came down a bit um, during the pandemic period. And then now that people are getting out, feeling safer, we're seeing services prices going up. The expectation was that 
goods prices would start to come down a lot quicker than they had. And we'll talk about this a little later. That's part of the reason why we've seen total inflation stay kind of high um, on a year over year basis. So now why does it matter? Why does it matter that inflation is high? Why should we even care about getting inflation down lower? Um, well, the Federal Reserve um, Board has two mandates. One, to have maximum employment growth. So grow the economy as fast as possible, get as many people working the low, a low unemployment rate and stable in, um, inflation. And what they mean by that is inflation is so low that you don't consider it in making business decisions. So um, some more background on that. Inflation is not good for long-term growth. It's a regressive tax. It hits the people making the least amount of money the hardest because they don't have discretionary income. Um, they have to choose whether to drive their car um, less or to um, have food on the table. Um, it distorts decision making. It can lead to inventory accumulation and can cause deeper recessions. An example here would be back um, in the 90s when we had the office related um, recession. Um, for example, if I were a um, builder of offices and I saw the price of steel going up 40% every six months, and I had some buildings that were going to take about two years before they were completed, in order to save money, I might be tempted because steel's going up 40% on a six month basis to go ahead and buy all the steel I'll need for this two year project. But what happens then if for some reason the economy starts to slow, banks may pull my credit so I, I can't even um, finish this property. And now I've got this building that's halfway built. I've got all the steel sitting in a warehouse. And so it could cause the recession to be longer and deeper if you see a lot of people doing this. We've, we have to wait until demand comes back, the economy starts to grow. Then we work off all that steel we've got sitting in the warehouse before we start to see uh, the economy getting back to a higher level of growth. So inflation is not good because it changes people's decision-making um, and it could cause them to increase inventories. It can cause price um, spiral upward with wages rising and inflation expectations become unanchored. So by that, what the Fed means is we no longer think inflation is going to be 2% every year. We think it's going to be 5% every year. And because of that, we expect to see a price in, we expect to see higher wages. And then when we expect to see higher wages and our employers give it to us, we then have a situation where the employers are having to increase their prices, which then leads to more inflation and us want more wages. And so it becomes a spiral upward. And here you can see um, at the bottom here, again, gray shaded areas recession. We're looking at compensation of employees. So this is wages and salaries as well as benefits. And you can see when we tack benefits on, it's it rose over 15% at one point. It slowed a bit, but 10% is still very high compared to what we've seen throughout most of history where those um, increases were hovering around the 5% uh, range. And another issue about inflation um, being bad for the economy is it can lead the Fed to continue to raise rates and push us into a recession. So, Let's talk uh, a little bit more about that. And for that, I'm going to have to give you a little uh, quick lesson on finance. So um, here we're looking at a yield curve. So um, here's the maturity, three month through 30 year. Here's the interest rate you're receiving. So a year ago, back in September 2021, the interest rate that you would receive on a three month to hold a three month tre treasury bill would be less than 0.1%. But if you were holding a treasury note for 10 years, then you would receive a, about 1.4% interest. Um, and that's because there's a lot more risk that could happen over that 10 year period. And that's why you require a higher rate. Going out to 30 year, if you held one there, it would be almost 2%. Now fast forward, and let's just look at the latest data in orange here. This is the end of last week. So now the three month bill, um, is up to a little over 3%, and that's basically because the Federal Reserve has been pushing up the federal funds rate. That's the only rate that the Fed can directly affect. When they push up the federal funds rate, then the shorter term rates go up as well. So you can see now the 10-year 
is at 3.4% um, is what it was this morning, and the 30-year is near 3.5. So we, uh, and an inverted yield curve is the best predictor of a recession. It's happened before every recession. It happens because the Fed pushes up interest rates at the short end and at the long end, they don't go up as much. So we look at the difference between the 10-year note here and the three-month bill to get a sense of whether it's inverted. It's, it's not inverted right now. The three-month is below the 10-year. So now the question becomes, well, what do people think is going to happen a year from now um, by the end of the year and a, a year out? And um, Xiaobing Shuai and I, Xiaobing's a, a um, senior economist with Chimura, and I um, submit our forecast to the blue chip financial forecast. There are about 45 um, economists that have been invited to do this, um, some other with Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, et cetera. And they release these um, forecasts of interest rates, GDP, inflation on a monthly basis. And so in September, I'm going to show you some of the results. Um, at the end of the year, um, the uh, economists with the highest forecast expected the federal funds rate to be at 4%. The consensus, that is the average of the 45 economists, is 3.4. Ten-year Treasury at 4%, and then the consensus, 3.2%. Um, the 30-year mortgage is tied to the 10-year Treasury. Uh, you may ask, why is it tied to the 10-year Treasury? And that's because, on average, people live in a house for about seven years. And the forecast is that it will be around 6.3% at the end of the year consensus or the highest forecast is 6.3, the consensus 5.6. Let's go out to the end of 2023 and the Fed funds rate, 4.6%, consensus 3.4. But I'm betting that when we see the October forecast from the blue chip, we'll see this number closer to 4% given what the Fed has been saying recently. Treasuries, 10-year, uh, 4.9, consensus 3.2, the high, for the mortgage, 6.9, and consensus, 5.5. So if we put that onto our yield curve, what does that look like? So here's the yield curve from a week ago. Right now, the consensus is predicting that um, we're going to see the federal fund rate target at 3.4% by year end. And we're going to see the 10-year note at 3.2% by year end. So clearly, the curve is inverted. So this says to me that this is a strong predictor of inflation, or I'm sorry, a strong predictor of a recession. Uh, so when we show you our forecast, you'll see that, see that we do have a recession in the forecast uh, for next year. So it typically takes six to nine months or even longer for increases in interest rates to fully impact the economy. So to give you a sense, um, the Fed had just started raising interest rates in the first quarter of this year, meaning that we are just now starting to feel the impact of those rate hikes. And the hikes that we're seeing, we're seeing a month ago or two months, two months ago, or the next rate hike that we see is not going to affect us fully until um, next year. Um, so in any case, this is what the consensus of 45 or so economists say about the economy in terms of interest rates meaning that it will um, lead us um, into a recession based on what we've seen historically. So what are Fed officials saying? And, and they're saying that the federal funds rate target is probably going to go higher than what the consensus of the economists were in um, September. So um, Loretta Mester from the Cleveland Fed said um, on September 10th, Elevated inflation was leading her to conclude that the central bank would need to raise the, the Fed funds rate to around 4% somewhat sooner than she had anticipated. In fact, earlier she had said 4.3% um, uh, and then made the comment that um, she felt that we would keep it at that rate, the Fed would keep it at that rate for all of 2023. And we'll get to that in a minute too. Uh, Governor Christopher Waller said that the Fed would need to lift the rate well above 4% if inflation accelerates in the coming months. So here you go. When the um, inflation rate came out today higher than expected, that's why the market sold off so much because they're anticipating that if it stays high, we're going to see a interest rate, federal funds rate, 
higher than 4%. But then also he said that they may stop raising it shy of 4% if suddenly we see inflation decelerating, um, which we haven't seen yet. And then Chair Powell at Jackson Hole um, just a couple of weeks ago, this is a big meeting that they have every year, uh, made some very strong statements about how um, they are purposely moving their policy stance to make sure we get back to that 2% inflation. And also he pointed out that um, uh, monetary deliberations, when they talked about it, they looked at what happened in the 1970s and 1980s, and they said they are not going to make that mistake again. So um, the question then becomes, um, what did happen in the 1970s and the 1980s? And here uh, you can see that on this chart, where in red, we're showing you the consumer price index percent change from a year ago. So this is the rate of inflation. And then the federal funds rate. Go to 1970 and 1980, when we saw an uptick in um, inflation, the Federal Reserve increased interest rates, inflation came down, and so the Fed decreased interest rates. But then look what happened. Inflation went back up, and so the Fed had to come back and decrease interest rates. So we had this double-dip recession, which was um, very difficult for the economy overall. So what the Fed is saying they learned from this is that we can't just assume when we see inflation coming down from 8 to 6 and maybe holding a bit at 6, maybe getting closer to 4, that they could start to ease. They're going to keep the rates high for some period of time before they start to ease. So um, now, now I, I hate that we're doing this at two o'clock because those of you on the East Coast have maybe your uh, lunches kicking in now. So I hope that you have some coffee. Um, here's where we'll get a little detailed, but I'll be very high level. Um, so the Fed um, may be going higher than, than they're communicating now because they're targeting neutral. Um, a neutral federal fund rate. So what is the neutral federal fund rate? It's theoretical. Um, unfortunately, we don't have labs where we could test things. We have theories that um, we come up with in economics. And the theoretical rate, the neutral rate, is something that's neither accommodative or restrictive. So if the neutral rate is 2.5%, then that means if we get above 2.5%, which is where they are now, it's going to start to slow the economy. Um, and it's what even makes it more difficult is it's partially based on longer term inflation. So it's based on what we expect inflation to come down to in the future. Uh, great article, if you want to read more on this, is from the Wall Street Journal in April. Neutral Fed fund rate is a moving target. Um, and here's another article, if you want to read about that. Um, Bill Dudley, former the New York um, Fed president, talked about just back in May, uh, whether that 2% target was right as neutral. And he said, given that average earnings are running 5.5%, given that productivity is slowing, it implies an inflation rate of 3.5 to 4. And that means if that's 3.5 to 4 is a long-term inflation rate, that means neutral federal funds rate is about 4%. So um, now I think basically the economy, the stock market is starting to agree with Bill Dudley's comments back in May that yes, neutral is probably somewhere closer to four than the 2.5 that the Fed was um, expecting earlier in the year. So um, just some other comments, a quote from Jerome Powell. So what does this all mean for the economy? Well, what they've told us is that they are going to increase um, the, the interest rates to bring demand and supply to better balance. And that's going to have to occur over a period of time where we're going to have sustained periods of below trend growth, meaning that our GDP for the next year or two or even longer is going to be around 2% or less growth when we've seen um, much faster than that over the past 10 years. Then also it's going to cause some softening of the labor markets. Um, it's going to bring some pain to households and businesses. That's because they're going to have to lay off people and the unemployment rate is going to be higher but a failure to restore price stability would mean far greater pain. So that's what the Fed has learned over time. We've got to get inflation back to 2% uh, for this economy to grow um, at a more stable rate. And this is somewhat disconcerting. An article just in the Wall Street Journal uh, last week by Jason Furman, who was looking at um, another study. In that study, 
it said to bring prices down to 2%, we may need to tolerate unemployment of 6.5% for two years. So clearly there's a lot of things swirling out there um, and it's all related to um, inflation, um, that inflation got away from the Fed and um, now we're gonna have to pay a price for it. So a soft landing, will we have a soft landing? Is the Fed bringing this plane in so that it will slow and then pick up or are we headed for a cliff? When we look at our own forecasts, that we do, and all of us economists have our um, forecasting models that many of them have the same um, same assumptions in them. Um, but here you can see our forecast um, after the first and second quarter of negative growth, we have some positive growth in the third quarter, slower in the fourth, and the first quarter of next year. And then we go into what we think the NBER will call an official recession in 2023. Uh, we expect it to be slow uh, or not very sharp and not very long. But again, that is dependent upon uh, what happens with inflation and how the Fed reacts th to that, I think, as you've seen here. So if we care so much about inflation, how did the Fed miss the trend? Um, well, first, as, as um, we think about the pandemic, we hadn't been in this situation um, before, or at least not in recent history. So we had the stage one, the supply shock. So non-essential business closed. Citizens were asked to stay home. We had the demand shock. Um, and during that demand shock, we had a lot of supply shortages. Semiconductor chips, a great example, um, where um, that caused a shortage of cars because um, they couldn't put them in the cars and there were other items that we had shortages of so we couldn't um, build the cars. So the Fed thought that once, you know, things got back to normal, these supply shortages would go away very quickly. And in fact, uh, former Vice Chair Ellen Blinder, very highly thought of economist, um, back in December of last year, um, said, so when it comes to inflation, I'm still on the transitory team. So what was he thinking? At that time, inflation was 4.7 for core, that's excluding food and energy, and it's 6.8 for CPI. And he's still saying, I'm on the transitory team um, because he said there's too much money chasing too few goods, but too much demand chasing too few supply. So again, he was looking at the supply shortage that he thought would go away. Um, and why did he expect inflation to slow? Because the price of oil was coming down, because consumers, he expected to shift purchasing services, less demand for goods. And you saw in the inflation chart I showed you earlier that, yeah, um, inflation for goods is slowing and for services is picking up, but um, it's still very high. And then he said, good old capitalism is going to make sure that we don't see this inflation stay high. And that is when we see shortages, um, there are high prices, firms are getting great profits, capitalists enter the market where there are shortages, and that's out of self-interest. And so uh, you all remember Adam Smith and the invisible hand. Uh, so that's what he was thinking about there would cause this situation to not be transitory. And he also argued that if the Fed raised rates now, by the time, because remember there's six to nine months or even a year before, the increase in interest rates impacts the economy. He said, if the Fed starts to raise rates now, then by the time it impacts the economy, inflation is going to be coming down on its own. And clearly we didn't see that. Um, another um, uh, Kansas City president in May, um, and this is when they start to shift and start to increase interest rates. So what they were starting to see there was that at first in 2021, when interest rates were going up, they were only on about 20% of all the categories was causing that increase. And actually 25% of the categories showed that inflation was coming down. But then when we got to 2021, about 50% of the spending showed inflation significantly above previous trends. And there was zero um, categories that were showing inflation coming down. So it became evident that Inflation by the middle of um, 2022 was broadening out into more categories rather than going away and that supply issues remained. So uh, 
when will we get back to normal? And the answer to that um, is dependent on a, a number of factors, such as the supply chain disruptions that we've talked about, the COVID lockdowns that they continue to have rolling in China. Oil prices have come down a bit, but are expected to maybe go back up again as we get to the winter months. We have food shortages related to Russia, Ukraine war, and we've got that wage price spiral that seems to be taking hold. So if we go back in history again, here in blue, you're looking at the consumer price index for all items. And in red, you're looking at it excluding food and energy. So let's go back at two periods where we had a similar issue of supply. Um, and the first one is the Korean War. And during the Korean War, we shifted a lot of workers and materials um, and factories toward the war effort. And when, so that created a supply um, issue. When the war ended, uh, we saw inflation come down very quickly. Uh, here's another example in the 70s and the 80s, the increasing food prices and Arab oil embargo. Uh, in that case, it did come down some, but then again, it went back up with another episode. So um, history doesn't give us a good guide in terms of how quickly the current inflation rates will come down. There's a lot of issues that are swirling around to make it stay higher. What should we be watching right now? I think aside from CPI, one of the most important things to watch is wages. Will they start to moderate? If we see the unemployment rate rise to 6.5%, then clearly um, we should see um, this employee ease market turn more to an employer's market. Uh, that may have an impact on this pace of inflation um, with wages that are much higher here, you see around the five to six percent range as opposed to the two per two, three percent range. Um, and this is just hourly earnings that does not have compensation in it as opposed to the earlier chart. Another thing we're watching is will more workers come back um, as the unemployment rate um, and will we see the unemployment rate rise? Here um, you can see that we had a huge drop off in participation. Uh, we have started to see it inch up a bit and the unemployment rate, in fact, in the latest um, report did inch up a bit because some of more employees were coming back. So this is another area to work, watch closely. How tight is the labor market? So in conclusion then, um, why do we expect a recession? We expect a recession because we don't expect inflation to drop quickly. So that's something that we're watching very closely. Will inflation drop quickly so that the Fed doesn't have to push interest rates up as much as we expect at this point? Um, we expect the Fed to continue to raise the federal funds rate. We're looking at something around 4.3% next year and then holding it steady um, for the entire year. Uh, remember, it takes some time for those rate hikes to impact the economy. Um, Homes, autos, capital expenditures become marginally uh, more expensive. So we see demand dropping. We've already seen that um, very much so in the um, uh, construction or the single family housing industry where some are calling that a recession at this point. We expect the yield curve to invert um, later this year. And by the way, um, with the consensus blue chip forecast, the yield curve inverts in the fourth quarter of this year. So again, that's a reason why we have um, the economy going into recession in the uh, middle of next year. Um, we also assume that supply chain issues ease some more this year, but not substantially enough to reduce inflation. And at this point, we expect only a mild recession. Um, so, not a lot of good news to present here. Um, a lot of uncertainty in the economy. For those of you in workforce, it looks like your job's going to get even tougher, even though it's been very tough trying to pull people back into the economy and those in economic development. Um, some slowdown we would expect in the expansion of firms, although on the positive side, we're expecting to continue to see firms coming in from um, overseas because we learned during these supply chain issues that we can't depend on other countries and that we need some of the supplies here at home. Um, GDP, we expect to be below potential for the next two years and the unemployment rate to inch up 
to around 5%. So with that, I am happy to um, answer any questions. I do see, I'm just looking at the chat right now, Kay asked, what does that mean for graduates coming out of high school and college? Well, um, so far this past year, this past summer, it's been a, a great market for those coming out of high school and college because of the number of people who have retired or who have not come back into the labor market for fear of getting COVID or um, um, just because they had other issues that they had at home caring for others or even long COVID has had an impact. So this year has been one of the best um, for our high school graduates and college graduates in quite a while. When we look to next year, I would expect that um, it's going to be harder for those individuals to find jobs. Um, some college students typically, when we go into recession, decide to um, remain in school and get uh, higher education degrees. So with that, Kevin, if there are some other questions you see out there, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Yeah, Chris, the only other question that we saw in the chat was uh, going back to, to the Fed Fed mandates. Um, okay, Rory, was, um, I see a question from Rory here. So if unemployment rates rise and then the unemployed, when are able to find work or go work again, might have to return to work at a lower wage than when they were laid off. If employers can lower wages because the supply of job seekers becomes greater and their demand for workers. If they have to return to work at lower wages, if inflation hasn't come down, then people would be making less or paying more. We've seen that before to an extent in our area before in workforce development. So yes, um, the if the unemployment rate goes up, then you're in a situation where uh, employers don't have to offer as much, um, but that I would not expect it, it's it's at the lower end, the lower skilled end, restaurant workers, uh, retail. Um, I think it's easier to bring down those wages from elevated rate, wages right now. If they're around, I know a, a restaurant just up the street from us is having to pay $25 an hour to get people to work. They may be able to get people to work for just $15 an hour if we get to the um, lower higher unemployment rate, but looking at um, professional workers or even factory workers, um, craft workers, once you take them to a higher rate, I would expect that you're going to have to keep them at that going forward um, instead of being able to bring those rates down. But you can bring your average rate down when you're bringing in new workers. Okay, aren't U.S. profit margins at record highs indicating that companies are profit-taking? How is profit-taking driving inflation? So, yes, some companies are seeing high profits. Others are not. It's it's interesting that um, companies often follow each other. Um, so, like this morning, I think Hard Rock uh, Cafe, Hard Rock Restaurant announced that it was increasing its wages, doubling it for many companies and the expectation was that we'll see other hotels and companies follow suit on that. So some of that profit margin uh, will go away. Um, so yes, if companies are taking profits and increasing prices, then that would just um, cause inflation to continue to remain higher. But um, there are other stories. Um, we haven't seen it in the data yet, but uh, where companies have large inventory, so they're having to price um, price cut in some of those cases. So that would help uh, bring inflation down. And then, of course, their profits won't be as great. And I see Michael with baby boomers continuing to retire and exit the labor force permanently. Will labor market tightness just be the new normal? Yeah, that's a good question. And that's what a lot of states and regions are grappling with. Now, some of those people who are near baby boom age, there was one interesting study that I saw um, people between the age of 55 and over, we've seen a big increase in retirement, but those that are 55 can't get social security yet. So they're still at a point where maybe they had enough savings or um, uh, 
they are, don't feel safe coming back into the market yet. So we may see um, those people coming back in, even though the young people like the 16 to 19, 21 year age, they're already back to pre-COVID levels. They're way below levels that were participation rate levels of 10 years ago. So there's room to bring more people back into the economy. But um, maybe this is consistent with Blinder's comment, Ellen Blinder's comment of the, you know, Adam Smith's invisible hand. So what we're seeing now in those low skilled jobs where we can't find the workers, we're seeing companies shift to technology. So we're seeing more of a shift to you go into McDonald's and you don't go to a cash register. You go to a kiosk kiosk and place your order um, or um, you go to a grocery store and there's not cash cashiers, but you put it in your container and it tracks from that. So we are seeing a shift to technology, which will help some of um, what was mentioned here as a permanent issue in a tight labor market. But there are some that have said, you know, even if we go into this recession, if it's a it's a mild recession like what we're predicting, we may see the unemployment rate stay relatively low because people are not coming back. If it's a prolonged recession where interest rates have gone much higher, then um, there I think we'll see people coming back to the labor market um, because of the need to work. Also, when we go into recession, you have more two wage earner families. When you're not in recession, maybe one uh, one uh, person can work, they lose their job. And so both of the individuals end up finding lower paid jobs, but both have to work. So that uh, tends to have an impact there. Uh, have you seen any data with parents staying home due to the pandemic, but the child care availability has decreased at the same time? Yeah, that's it. That's a good question. In fact, um, I have some slides on that. Um, that show that um, I'm trying to remember them now that there was a, and this is, if you have Jobs EQ, you can look it up in Jobs EQ. Um, child care is uh, one of the industries. And in the US, it came down, um, it's moved back up to pre pandemic levels. The number of firms, I think, is up as well, but the wages are very low. And it's, incre it's interesting over the past two years, if you look at um, historical wages for child care workers, they have now accelerated. So um, that that could probably help too. But I think uh, one of the things that a lot of uh, regions and states are looking at from a policy perspective, how can we drive more people um, back in is by providing um, child care because it is so expensive right now and because there are um, so few workers and even some businesses attaching, especially health care. Um, attaching um, child care um, uh, units to their firm or the hospital. Uh, just curious, would appreciate your insight on the housing and rental markets. Yes, there um, they have gone up quickly, and um, the latest data is saying that the rental markets is probably the rate increases is probably peaking now. Um, housing prices are not going depreciating, but the offering prices are coming down. People are having to lower their price to get people to offer rather than you know, six months ago. Just six months ago, you put your house on the market and you get five offers all above your bid price. So that that has ended and rental prices will be coming down as well. Uh, inflation is everywhere and always a monetary policy. Thanks for that, Christopher. Yes, I agree. And it seems that the Fed lost sight of that. Um, I meant to look at monetary... Uh, uh, M2 before this presentation, but uh, it was growing very, very fast. And there's something called modern monetary theory, which is kind of beyond me. Um, it assumes that monetary growth doesn't matter. Um, and I don't know how much the Fed bought into that, but I think that they could probably um, throw that idea out the window uh, now, given how much um, monetary um, money supply increases have impacted the economy. Um, Kevin, are you there with us? Have you seen, I'm just seeing the last few questions. Yeah, Chris, can, can there you hear any me? Other that occurred earlier that I can answer. Yeah. Hey, Chris, can, can you hear me? If you're with us, you um, probably are still on mute. And I'm looking back through. Um, 
Yes, 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 thank you, thank you. Uh, that, yes, thank you. That, um, that has yeah. a big impact and more so on low income individuals. Hey, Chris, are you able to hear me? Debbie is missing you at uh, VEDP, Kevin. <laughs> I, oh, how is the country's immigration policies impacting our workforce? Um, yeah, so it's funny, you can hear Kevin, but I can't, but, um, so I'll just, yeah, that is funny. Um, so immigration policies, uh, there are two things that lead to how fast this economy can grow. One is um, um, productivity, the other is population growth. So you add the two together and you basically get how fast this economy can grow. So um, right now, um, if immigration policies were loosened, especially in those areas where we have short supplies or tight, um, that would certainly help this economy. Won't demographic trends, lower birth rate cause, less employment, unemployment. Um, so yes, and that, that connects to just what we were talking about. So as we look back to the 1980s when the baby boomers were coming into the economy and the labor force growth rate, rate was more around four or 5% more women were coming into the economy, then the economy could grow much faster than um, than it could now where we have less people coming into the economy. Same with lower birth rate, um, causing lower um, unemployment. And Japan is a great example where you can see that as well. So Kevin, um, even, even though I can't hear you, I'm going to let you take over if you would like to wind down. Uh, yeah, everyone. So thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I think a couple of other folks had asked if the if the questions and the um, recording would be available. And yes, we will send this out to everyone. Um, hopefully, once I get it loaded um, on the website and on YouTube, we'll go ahead and send out the slides um, and a link so you can download the presentation. Kevin, I'm, since I can't hear you, I hope I'm not talking over you. Um, Christine asked about what, um, if anything, can workforce providers prepare young adults for the rising inflation? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think they need to be mindful of, of knowing what the inflation rate is so that they can better ask for um, um, the pay increases that they, they will need to, if, you, if you're armed with the information and go to your um, employer of, you know, this is, this is what, um, um, inflation is doing and the impact it's having. There's a great, if you, um, inflation um, uh, tracker on BLS that you can go to and, and see that. And I see that it looks like Kevin has winded us down. So I will end for now. And, and Christine, if you want to follow up with me on that inflation tracker thing on the web, I can um, just reach out to your, um, whoever you work with, with Jobs EQ, and um, I'll be happy to uh, get back to you. Thanks.